Hey Uprising students, it's Wednesday at 6 o'clock and we're right back here with another Uprising Live. Uh, before we kick off, we wanted to remind you of a few quick announcements. First, make sure you come out on Sunday nights all this summer. We're going to be hanging out at my house with our uh, super awesome, super talented summer intern, James Hudgens. He's going to be uh, helping us as we walk through um, what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's a great time. Um, food's provided each week. We make sure to take all necessary precautions so that no one catches Rona. So make sure you show up for that each Sunday at 6 p.m. at my house. If you need uh, directions or a ride, you feel free to, to DM us or call us. We'll be glad to get you there. And we also want to let you know about something we're really excited about, and that's that we have our Ignite Weekend back on the calendar. It's going to be happening August 1st. Um, as kind of a back to school one day, one Saturday event. It's going to be a great time. Um, so make sure uh, you check that out. Uh, go to the link on the screen, fbcgreenville.net forward slash ignite. Uh, all the information as well as a link to sign up is there. The cost is just $20 and you can even pay online if you'd like or you can pay later. So make sure you check that out or send your, your parents uh, that link and tell them, hey, sign me up. I want to go to this. It'll be a great uh, weekend experience for you to, to learn what it means to be truly free in Christ. All right, so let's get kicked off with uh, a new series. We're going to be looking at the U effect. Check it out. Well, all right. Like we said, we're talking about the U effect. And I want to tell you a story as we get started about someone who I went to school with. Um, I, I grew up with him. He was in the same at primary school, elementary school, middle school, high school as me. And we were never really like close, like personal friends. We never had, I think, the same class together. But it was this guy named Tyler Welch who was always a really big influence in me. He was like that one person who was who was always just fun to be around. Like you knew, like if you were going to be in, in, in a class project or you're going to be doing something, if Tyler was in that group, it was going to be fun because he was just a fun-loving person, right? He never he never intended to be. He was just kind of always attracting, you know, people around him. And, and, and you probably know those people, right? That for whatever reason, they're always sort of the center of attention. They're always a good time to be around. Or maybe you know some people that are, are like that in, in a, in a not-so-positive way. Maybe you know people that people are always walking on eggshells around them. They're always trying to avoid them. But for whatever reason, these type of people have a large influence, right? They, they, they affect people around them. And here's the truth about people like that. They don't really think about it. People who have a large influence oftentimes don't think about their influence or even realize that they have that influence. And that's what we're going to be talking about during the, the next three weeks. In, in, in the U effect, we're going to be talking about influence and how we can leverage that influence. And, and here's, here's the truth. I, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that some of you out there feel like you have a lot of influence. Maybe you feel like you're a Tyler Welch, right? And, and you have a lot of influence on, on the people around you and your friend circle and your family and people kind of listen and you can kind of lead. Maybe you've even been given the opportunity to serve in leadership positions in your school and other places. And, and, and then there's some of you who feel like you have no influence, who you feel like no one listens to you. You feel like the only person below you on the totem pole is the family dog, and even sometimes they don't listen to you. And that's okay, right? What I want you to know is regardless of where you feel like you are or maybe really you actually are at in that, in that sphere of influence, it's normal. It doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're better or worse than anybody else. It's, it's normal to have a, a certain level of influence depending on where you're at. Tonight we're going to look at a story from, from the Bible, a story from the life of Jesus, where we see people with a lot of influence and people with not so much influence, and how they all can come together and really make a big difference. Let me set the scene for you, okay? 
Jesus is, is out and he's, he's got these followers, as he often did, as he would teach. People would follow him. People would, would want to listen to his teachings. In this one particular instance, the Bible tells us that there were 5,000 men, plus all the women and children. They couldn't even count, right? Just 5,000 men. So there was this large crowd that gathered, and, and, and they're following Jesus, and, and they're, they're getting ready to listen to him. And, and here's what it says. We're going to pick up in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus crossed over the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following, following him wherever he went, because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. So, so, right, so all these people have come out to follow Jesus, and, and for whatever reason, no one thought to pack a lunch, right? They just all assumed, like, hey, there's going to be, like, you know, a Chipotle along the way, and we'll be good. And so Jesus looks, and he says, hey, there's a lot of people, Philip. What are we going to do? And this is where Jesus is looking to Philip, even though Jesus knows what Jesus is going to do. He says, Philip, what should we do? And oftentimes, I, I want to just take a pause here in, in what we're talking about to see that oftentimes in our lives, Jesus will put us in a situation and say, hey, what are you going to do? When really the answer is, is all along, it's like, Jesus, you're Jesus. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look to you, right? But look at how Philip responds, okay? So Philip said, uh, replies, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. He says, hey, man, look, it doesn't matter how, you know, it would take literally a half a year's salary to feed all these people. Like, can you, it'd be like saying, hey, Philip, um, there's a bunch of people. Could you go buy McDonald's and order 5,000 Happy Meals? Like, it, it just, it was, it was insurmountable. There was no way to feed this many people. It would have taken a massive effort. If you've ever been to, um, to the Passion Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, there's, there's literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, and they feed them in a matter of 30 minutes, but it's a huge huge effort to get that done. And, and, and they're asking Philip and, 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 and 11 other disciples, like, hey, man, do you think you could just whip up some grub for these people? Let's keep going, okay? Verse 8, then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five, uh, five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? And so here we have um, Peter, right? Simon Peter, who's, who's like, hey, um, I mean, there is this kid who's got, you know, some bread and fish, but I mean, compared to this many people, it's, it's, it's crumbs, right? So, so maybe Peter was, was having some faith here. Maybe Peter was trying to be sarcastic. I personally, when I read the Bible, I see Peter as someone who's a lot like me, and I'm pretty sarcastic. So I'd like to think that Peter was, was a little bit sarcastic here, just trying to, to bring some humor to the situation. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't dismiss that. Instead, Jesus says, um, tell everyone to sit down. Jesus said, so they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. And so they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely this is the prophet we have expected. There's, there's a lot of really unique things happening here that I want you to catch. Some of, them, some of them go into what we're talking about. Some of them I just want you to see. First of all, I want you to see that, that, that with, with, with far less than what seemed needed, Jesus did not give the people what they would have normally gotten that day. You see, in this day, the idea of being full, of having everything you wanted, would have been unheard of. Having everything you needed to sustain your body through the next day, yes. But being full was something that was a, a luxury. We take it for granted. I can go to the Mexican restaurant and eat chips till I'm full. But these people didn't have that. But in this moment, not only did, did what they seemed like wasn't enough to even meet their basic needs, well surpass that. And that's the love of Christ, that when we think he'll just give us what we need to survive, we find that he gives us more than that. He gives us what we need to thrive. He gives us everything we could ever want. But I want to ask a question as we go back to our topic we're talking about of influence. As we see something this, this great happening, 
who had the biggest influence in this moment? I mean, certainly Jesus played a big influence, right? As, as he, he should. He's Jesus. He had an influence. The people were following him. Maybe, maybe the disciples, right? Maybe, maybe Philip and Peter, they kind of had an influence in this. They were kind of part of the dialogue. But I think someone who in this moment had possibly the biggest influence, you know, sparing Jesus, is the boy. I mean, he didn't take the stage. He wasn't well known or in a position of leadership. He wasn't a speaker or a preacher. He wasn't a super athletic or popular and academic. He wasn't cool or interesting enough that the writer would even tell us this boy's name. But because of his, his ability to come only with what he had, even though it didn't seem like enough, but he was willing to say, here's everything I've got. We see 5,000 men plus women and children, this massive amount of people, witness this miracle. It's not, the miracle is not that they were fed. The miracle is that they saw Jesus, and at the end it says, surely this is the prophet we've been looking for. Surely this is the Messiah. Because of this one boy's willingness to say, hey Jesus, I have pretty much nothing, and you can have all of it. Because of his willingness to do that, 5,000 men plus women and children, so we can probably estimate at least 10,000 people, looked upon this Jesus and said, wow, that's the Messiah. That's the one person who I should devote my life to. That's what the Christian life is about. We, talk, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Our life is, is but one thing, and it's to make much the name of Jesus. And this boy did that with what seemed like very little influence. But when he leveraged his influence into Christ's hands, it became great. He brought all that he had, and that was enough. And what I want you to know is, Everything you have is enough. And so the main, main point I want you to realize tonight, the main uh, idea that I want you to, to, to see is this right here. You have more of an effect than you think. You have more of an effect than you think. Just like we were talking about those people in our lives, those, those people like Tyler Welch who, who didn't really think about the effect they had on people, the influence they had on people, you, you probably don't think about it but you have a much larger influence on people than you realize. Having an impact isn't about doing more, having more, or knowing more people. It's simply about, like the boy, bringing everything you have to Jesus and knowing that that's enough. And so here's a few steps I want you to, some practical steps you can take to begin to recognize and leverage your influence for, for things that matter, for making much the name of Jesus. The first step is to identify who. Identify who in your life, who in your circle of, of people that you interact with regularly you can influence, who, who, will, who will listen to you, who maybe looks up to you as an example. Maybe that's a close friend or, or, or a sibling. Whoever it is, identify the who. Next, identify the what. What does that person need? How could that person's life be made better? How could they be drawn closer to the Lord? And then finally, identify the what. What can you do to help? What can you do to, to do that? Maybe, maybe it's being nice to your brother or sister who's, who's younger than you and, and helping them and, and giving them a, a, a mold to follow. Maybe it's a friend who who's making some bad choices, and you can help them by, by starting by setting that example and by having those discussions. Maybe, maybe it's nothing like that. Maybe it's an 80-year-old neighbor who's, who's having a hard time mowing their yard. Maybe you can just set an example by saying, look, I don't have much, but I'll come over and I'll mow your lawn. I'll bring everything I have, and I'll know that that's enough. You have more of an impact than you think. The, the question to ask yourself isn't, do I have the ability to impact others? Instead, the question should be, how will I use the influence that I have already to influence others for the glory of, of, of Christ's name? Ultimately, God is the one who has the power to change people. We can't forget that, that that's not our job. God has that power. All you have to do is show up, offer what you have, and let God do the rest. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for our ability to continue to meet via this live stream event. And God, we, we eagerly pray that you would 
quickly deliver the day when we can come back to this room and we can meet in person and we can we can laugh and we can fellowship together and we can lift high praises to your name. But God, whether we meet here or, or somewhere else, God, help us to see the reality that you have given us all that we need to influence others around us and to bring glory and honor and praise to your name. God, help us to to look around us and see the people that we can influence. Let us see what they need and then give us the courage to see how we can influence them and, 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 and the boldness to do it, Lord. God, we ask as we leave our time together that you would equip us for the good work that we know that you've called us to do. God, we thank you for your son, and we submit these prayers to you in the name and by the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.